All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Selico. Many of you know, know me. I'm the superintendent of schools, so it's uh, good to see all of you. I know we have our, I believe, our upperclassmen here today, so this should be uh, a different kind of conversation than we have had at middle school and even with our freshmen and sophomores that, um, you know, you are, number one, on the brink of becoming adults, so the consequences, you know, for your actions are going to be very severe soon, right, as, as we enter adulthood. But we have a number of people here today that are going to talk to you about uh, safety and making good decisions. And those of you who were here last year saw a similar presentation with similar speakers, and some of them are the same. Uh, so we are going to be respectful of them. They took out uh, a good portion of their day to be here with all of you, and so we're very appreciative of that. And one of the things that you're going to see here today, we're going to start with um, officers, and we're going to move all the way to judge. So what that means is when you get in trouble, and hopefully you never do, but you start with the officer and you'll see the process that it takes in order to see what that consequence is and how it ends with the judge and what some of those um, things that happen uh, that, that you've done and what the consequences mean for some of those actions. Now, again, I hope that we never get to that point. That is from the legal standpoint. You know from the school standpoint as superintendent. Unfortunately, some of you have had to visit me. It's not many, thankfully, but if you are in a lot of trouble at school and you do something quite severe, you end up in my office where you can be expelled from school for up to one school year, depending on your infraction. Then from me, most likely, you end up in the court system. So we don't want that for you. That's why we're here today to talk to you, uh, not lecture you, but educate you. You're old enough to understand this as not a lecture or a threat, but as just a way of educating you on the do's and don'ts, really mostly the don'ts of the decisions that we make related to uh, threats and um, weapons. You know, we know not to bring those kinds of things to school. So it is my job as superintendent to make sure you are safe and secure and feel good about coming to school and don't have to worry about bullying or harassment. And so that is also included in some of our conversations here today. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to our speakers today. And one I'm going to begin with is uh, Mr. Gesford is our new security supervisor. So he will be around the district. <laughs> some fans already, and he just started. Um, we have officer, our SRO, Officer Davis. Police Chief Davis, who's also here. We have FBI Special Agent Kurt Durker is here. We have a prosecutor here from the Summit County uh, Prosecutor's Office, which is Elliot uh, Kolkovich. And finally, we have Judge Lisa Coates from Stowe Municipal Court. All right, thank you again. I'm going to expect nothing but the best um, from you, especially as upperclassmen, you know how to sit and listen. So I'm going to be real appreciative of you eyes forward and being respectful uh, listeners. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Chief Davis. Well, thanks for being here. I know you didn't have a choice, but thanks for being here. Um, we've been doing this all day, and I'll be honest, this probably affects this group more than anybody else because of your age. Um, in fact, some of you are probably adults, so you're gonna be hearing a lot of things that are consequences for your decision making. But the key to this whole day has been safety, your safety, the school safety, and creating a safe environment for you to come to school every day. It's crucial to us in law enforcement, it's crucial to me as a, as a Cuyahoga Falls resident, as a Cuyahoga Falls police chief, that you can come to school every day and be safe and not have to worry about threats and not have to worry about some of the stupid nonsense that goes on in the internet. But unfortunately, some of the stupid nonsense that goes on the internet is caused by you guys. Um, so we're gonna talk to you today about if you do that kind of stuff, what's gonna occur. You know, if you think about it, if you've been seeing, some of the schools are taking away phones from their students. And I don't think you guys want that. I, th I think you enjoy having that phone and having that responsibility of the phone, but you also have to respect that you've been given a tool that can at times be construed as a criminal tool. I know that's not one of the crimes we talked to you about, but if you use your phone to commit a crime, it becomes a criminal tool, and you can be charged with that. 
Not only that, we can get a search warrant and we can go through your phone. So I doubt anybody in this room wants my officers, my detectives, to go through your phone and see every text, video, picture that you've sent, received, or downloaded on your phone. I'm, I'm gonna be safe to guess that. But we can, we will, and if you think you deleted it, if you think you scrubbed it, you didn't, it's there. We can dig it out and we can find it with a search warrant. So if nothing else gets to you today, remember that we can get into your phone and see all your stuff. So please don't be stupid with it. We want you to be safe, we want you to enjoy school. There's already been four or five incidents locally that I've seen already this school year with, with hoax threats, but the one thing I can tell you, they've all ended in an arrest. And if we have to come knock on your door at midnight because I got a call from one of the administrators that said there was something online that's gonna cause a disruption in our school tomorrow, we're gonna knock on your door. And you might not have been the one that sent it out originally, but you sent it, somebody told us you sent it, so we're gonna find out who you got it from. Then we're gonna go knock on their door. We're gonna keep knocking on doors until we can feel safe that the school can open the next day without any kind of danger to any of our students. And unfortunately, we're gonna be charging people with criminal uh, act. So please be smart with your phones. Please be the adults that you are. Please make good choices with that, as well as other things. You've, you've got the keys to the universe in your hands now, which is mind boggling for an old guy like me. But literally, you know, you were taught as a kid not to talk to strangers, but we've given you a device that you can talk to anybody in the world at any time. So remember that that's a responsibility as well as a privilege. So I'm gonna turn it over to your school resource officer, Officer Davis. Good afternoon. We are going to treat you guys differently than we treated the freshmen and the sophomore and the students at Bullock and Roberts. You guys are young adults, especially you seniors. You're 17 or 18 years old. Take what you hear today to heart because like Chief Davis said and Dr. Selico said, this affects you guys the most. You guys, if you're not 18, you're going to be 18 shortly. This will affect you. If you get charged with a crime at the age of 17 or 18, it's going to affect colleges, jobs, your personal life. So think long and hard before you guys send that picture, send that text, do what you're gonna do with your cell phones. And it's a privilege to have your cell phones during the school day. In Akron, they don't have their phones anymore. They come into school, the school takes their phone. They get it back when they leave for the day. So the district right now is allowing you guys that privilege of having your phones throughout the school day. Let's keep it that way. Um, a couple things to talk about. I think the year's been off to a good start. Uh, some things that do concern me, kind of on a frontline basis. Uh, let's make sure that we're coming into school through the right doors. Let's make sure that we're leaving the school through the right doors. Um, I still see doors being propped open. Um, I see students opening the door for another student because they're late for class. It only takes five seconds to leave that door open and somebody come in the school that we don't want in the school. There's a reason we do what we do. There's a reason you guys come in and sign in or sign out with Ms. Schaefer. We need to know who's in the school at all times. Seniors, juniors, we expect the most out of you guys, right? So set the tone for the freshmen and the sophomore, sophomores. Just so there's no misunderstanding, I wanna read something to you real quick. This is from the Ohio Revised Code. This is inducing panic. No person shall cause the evacuation of any public place or otherwise cause serious public inconvenience or alarm by doing any of the following. Initiating or circulating a report or warning of an alleged or impending fire, explosion, crime, or other catastrophe, knowing that such a report is, uh, I'm sorry, that such report is, warning is false. Uh, no person shall threat, threaten to commit any offense of violence and no person shall commit any offense with reckless disregard of the likelihood that its commission will cause serious public inconvenience or alarm. Basically what that means, do not send any text, social media threat on TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever you have, even if it's a joke, we will find out who you are and you guys can be charged with a crime. If you're 17 or 18, there's a good chance you get charged as an adult for that crime. And to expand on what Chief Davis talked about, I spent the two years prior to being the SRO back in the Detective Bureau. If we think there's evidence of a crime on a cell phone, we can take that cell phone. We will lock it up in an evidence locker, and then we will write up a search warrant. 
We will take that search warrant to Judge Coates and explain to Judge Coates what we have and why we want to look through that phone. If she agrees with us, she signs off on the warrant. We get the phone out of evidence. We extract all the information that's on that phone, everything, pictures, videos, snaps, TikToks. We have access to it all. Even if it's been deleted, we still have access to it. So if you're under the age of 18, we're telling mom and dad. All right, does everyone understand that? Once we have that evidence, we take it to a prosecutor. Uh, in your case, we'd more than likely take it to a juvenile prosecutor. However, that juvenile prosecutor might say, you know what, let's refer this to Summit County, even if you're 16 or 17. Then we deal with Elliot Kulkovich, downtown Akron. It's a different ball game for you guys at your age. All right? We all good on that? I think you guys know I'm pretty laid back, but we take this stuff seriously. Dr. Selico, Mr. Gesford, the chief, and the entire police department take your safety very seriously. We don't mess around with it. So the pictures we're going to take a look at, some of the pictures were from last year. I know the initial reaction is to giggle, but it's not funny. This is going on all over the country. These pictures are being posted by kids your age and even younger. Imagine waking up, grabbing your cell phone, pulling up TikTok, and seeing something like that. And it says, Chicago Falls High School. Are you guys going to school that day? But here's the problem we're running into. Instead of you guys letting us know, you guys are sharing it. Let's not do that either. If you guys see anything like this, you need to let us know. Call the police department. This one actually happened in the district last spring. A young student just created a TikTok video, had a bunch of screenshots, did a little song and dance to it. Can everyone read that? Gum and gun. He thought it was funny. Sent it out. A parent saw it in the middle of the night. Uh, Special Agent Dirk will talk about this in a minute. There's a hotline to the FBI that you can call. That's what this parent did, so I get a phone call. Five o'clock in the morning. That's not the way to start the day, right? So we're knocking on the door at six o'clock in the morning, letting this parent know that her child had done this. Uh, there were school consequences. If that student was a little bit older, there could have been legal consequences. Again, if you guys see something, let Mr. Smith, let me know, let a teacher know, let your parents know. With all that being said, uh, special agent from the FBI, Kurt Durker. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chicago Falls. So I'm here to talk to you guys today about what the FBI's role is in all this stuff and kind of what you could be looking at if you draw our attention. So as Officer Davis alluded to, we have a National Threat Operations Center located in West Virginia. So what happens is when one of these posts goes out and somebody decides to notify us about it, it gets sent to this National Threat Operations Center. The folks that work there are very skilled and adept at quickly getting uh, subpoenas or whatever other legal process they need to track down whoever it was that made these postings. And they get it through exigent requests, which, which means that they make exceptions to expedite the subpoena to get the information back. So they'll quickly get the information and then they'll identify what geographic area in the country that the posting came from and then they'll send that lead to a specific field office to a specific agent, we'll grab his or her buddy and then we'll go knock on a door and then you're meeting two FBI agents for the first time. So this stuff is highly, highly traceable and highly trackable, okay? So, that's what we see on the lower end are these little one-off postings like this that draw our attention and we take them very seriously. When this first started, we would go out knocking doors and give warnings, okay? But the more and more this has gone on, law enforcement has less and less patience for it. So we're starting to see people get charged with these cases. A lot of times the juveniles will get charged in the state system, okay? If you're an adult, you'll get charged and it gives you exposure to us in the federal system. And if you watch any TV show or you talk to a lot of people that have been arrested, they do not want to be charged federally on a case. They will ask, can you charge me with this state? Because they don't want federal charges because they are, they're heavier, okay? So do not expose yourself to getting a charge 
because you forwarded or mated one of these postings. Okay, the other thing that we see on the larger end, the bigger scale is the swatting. Who here knows what swatting is? All right, a lot of you guys have probably heard of it. That is when you make that fake 911 call alleging that there is a shooting at a school, a church, or something going on at a house. When you do that, a lot of times people try to anonymize how, the, how they're making those calls. They think they can, but we now know how to track specifically who made those calls. We have the appropriate contacts, we have everything we need to trace that swatting call back to the person that made the call. And the, the local jurisdictions are running out of patience with these things. And if the person is under 18, these local jurisdictions are charging these people. And in one case, a local kid here, 16, in Medina, was just charged as an adult because he called another state in another state and made a swatting call, prompting a law enforcement response, making officers turn those lights on, sirens, run, go through red lights in a hurry to get there, thinking that they're going to roll up on the scene of a violent encounter. What do they get? They get a peacefully assembled school, okay? So you get an officer who's amped up at this level, showing up at a school, and it's not funny, okay? I train these, these officers and agents in these tactical responses, and we get them ready to go and prepared to handle these incidents. And it's not funny when they get sent out to something, all right? So don't do any of this stuff, guys. Just be careful, be smart. The last thing I'm gonna talk to you about before I hand it over is probably the most important thing you're gonna hear from me today, and I've said this at every, every assembly I've spoken at, it's sextortion. Who here knows what sextortion is? Okay, I'll explain for those who don't. And this is for everyone, parents, teachers, and all the students out here, okay? Sextortion is basically, you're online talking to somebody, and another user who you don't know in a lot of these cases, gets you to send a provocative picture of yourself, okay? A photo where you're exposing yourself to them, okay? Your private areas. They're taking that photo then, and they will threaten you once they have it, that they're gonna start sending it to all your friends and contacts, your parents and your relatives, unless you send them money, okay? So they're extorting money from you. In a lot of these cases, kids are panicking because the embarrassment. They don't want that provocative photo of them being sent out to all their friend groups. So what do they do? They start sending money. And these people are professional scam artists, okay? Many of them are in other countries. Some of them are operating in the continental US. But chances are, if you're talking to this young girl online and she's sending you pictures of her, herself, or you're talking to a handsome young guy online, chances are those pictures, it's some old guy sitting behind a computer, okay? It's a scammer. Guys, do not send these photos of yourselves out online, okay? Do not put yourself in a position to be extorted, all right, in that way. If you do, or if you have, please talk to an adult, okay? A lot of people have heard, heard, have, here have heard about the unfortunate case in Streetsboro with a young man who had all the promise in the world, but one of these scammers was so convincing that they backed this young man in a corner. He thought there was no way out, so he took his own life. We don't want you guys to do that, guys. So avoid putting yourself in that position in the first place. But if you do, or you have found yourself in that position, please, 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 please talk to an adult. We will help you through that situation, okay? It is not going to ruin your life. We can help you through it. But let's start by avoiding that stuff. All right, guys? Thank you for your attention today. Right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Elliot Kolkovich with the Summit County Prosecutor's Office. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time and attention today. I do um, want to just chat a bit uh, about being a prosecutor, how we fit in this process. Um, but first, I want to echo what Agent Durker said here. You know, as uh, Officer Davis did mention, those uh, explicit pictures, if you're sending those, that can be a crime. But if you are in a position where someone is trying to extort you, you are potentially a victim at that point. And there are going to be a lot of resources for you at that point. If you ever find yourself being victimized, make sure you know to reach out. We are going to be here to help you, protect you and go after the person that's victimizing you. So how the prosecutor's office fits in? Well, we take cases from Cuyahoga Falls Police Department, uh, the FBI, and we put them together, reports, talk to witnesses, and we present cases to convict criminals, and then bring those cases to Judge Coates and our county judges and ask for punishment. So I'm gonna talk about some of the crimes that can apply to you today um, to make sure as, 
as everyone has said before, that you guys have the information, that you guys know what the law is, what is out there, and what you can be held responsible for if you were to do any of these things, okay? Um, first of all, how many people here are 18? We're going to be 18 by the end of the year, school year. Yeah, it's a lot of people, right? I mean, you're going to hit a big milestone there turning 7 to 18. When you're 17, commit a crime, you could potentially be prosecuted as a juvenile. When you are over 18, you're going to be prosecuted as an adult. It is not detention. It is not DYS. It's jail. It's prison. And frankly, if you commit a crime while you're 17 but prosecuted for it while you're 18, you're still held responsible as an adult. So this is a very serious time as you obviously as you're turning 7 to 18. A lot of new responsibilities. A lot of exciting stuff, but a lot of new responsibilities too. All right, so I do want to talk a bit about some of the crimes here. This crime here, menacing. It's when you cause someone to think you're going to cause them harm, which I'm sure anybody who has younger siblings maybe has done at home once or twice in their life, right? But there's 1,500 kids in this school, and there's nothing that everybody here takes more seriously than protecting all of you. And a threat like that made at a school like this is going to be taken a lot more seriously than it may be at home when you're arguing with a brother or sister. And this is just where a crime can start. I'm going to let Judge Coates get up and talk about all the penalties for these crimes. But I just want to talk about what the elements are. So this is making somebody believe you could hurt them. Next slide, please. Aggravated menacing is the next step up. That's a threat, but you're causing someone to believe you're going to cause serious harm. When we see these in adult court and aggravated menacing, they're usually accompanied by someone holding a knife or holding a gun. That's going to go up just a little bit more. That's a slightly more serious crime. Telecommunications harassment. This is going to be kind of encompassing any of that menacing I just talked about, except it's, bun, it's done through a phone. Text somebody, leave a voicemail, social media message, anything like that where you use an electronic device and doing it repeatedly, that's going to be telecommunications harassment. That's a slightly more serious crime. There's another crime called menacing by stalking. That's those kind of same charges, that menacing, but maybe that's combined with following somebody, close proximity, driving around their house, sending a lot of messages. That's going to be a slightly more serious crime. And you can see how quickly these things elevate. And again, Judge Coates will talk about those penalties. Last one here is the most serious crime we talked about. And just as Officer Davis said, we've seen these cases come by our office. And sometimes they're meant as a prank or a joke, uh, a bomb threat, because I got a test that day or something like that. But they are not jokes when we are prosecuting them. Inducing panic is when you are evacuating a school. Anything you're doing that can be evacuating a school, causing serious public inconvenience. And the reason for that is that there is nothing in this world more terrifying than being a parent and getting a message on your phone that's saying that something's happened at your school, that something's happened at your kid's school, that there's a lockdown, that there's an evacuation. You know, my son just finished primary school, and they call them emergency drills there. I know you guys are getting to be adults now. I know what you know those are for. There's nothing more terrifying as a parent than getting that message or worrying about that. And that's why we take these crimes seriously. And we want to make sure that you guys have all the information you need to avoid ever coming across us. As I like to say, it's great being here. I hope I never see any of you people again. Because I never want to see any of you come across my office. And I'm sure Judge Coates would agree with that. All right, everyone. Thank you again for your time. Here's Judge Coates. Good afternoon, Cuyahoga Falls. I am the last speaker before your freedom for the day. I don't know if you have more classes or not, but I'm probably the holdup. First, I want to reiterate what the chief said earlier. I know that you may not believe this, but everyone has one of those phones or one of those devices of some sort or computers, iPads, whatever, and you probably think to yourself, there's no way that police departments and FBI can get in my phone and see all my stuff well, if they've got probable cause to believe there is something going on, some kind of threat, some kind of crime, some kind of photo, anything that leads to a crime, they can come to me and they can ask me for a subpoena or a search warrant to search. And I can do those upwards of two or three a day. Now, I've been here today, so I haven't had them, but there's probably some when I get back. But I'm just telling you, if you don't believe what the officer is saying, I'm telling you that it does happen and it happens regularly. So if you don't want people seeing things on your phone and you know it's not right to do, please don't do it. 
okay? Whether it's photos, whether it's I'm gonna bully somebody or threaten somebody or whatever it is, okay? That's number one. Number two, um, you know, I, I, I'm glad I'm seeing you in this uh, situation. I do not want to see you, and most of you are getting very, very close to being adults, so if you get in trouble as an adult, there's a very good likelihood you're gonna cross paths with me in my neck of the woods, which is the courtroom. And I'd much rather educate you today than to have you standing in front of me um, and having to uh, impose a sentence on a, on a crime. So I'm hoping you're listening carefully. I'm not threatening you, but I am going to tell you what the consequences of some of these um, offenses that um, our wonderful prosecutor just went through today. Um, I'm gonna go over some of the consequences you could face as an adult if you were, if you were charged and pled or found guilty of these crimes. Menacing is a crime of violence. That was the one where you, um, you uh, allow somebody to believe you're gonna cause them physical harm. As an adult, that's a misdemeanor of the fourth degree and could carry with it up to 30 days in jail. Aggravated menacing, if you remember, um, that was described as um, believing that you're gonna cause serious physical harm to somebody. So that's where you're um, threatening somebody with a knife or a gun or something uh, of a weapon. Uh, and that's a misdemeanor of the first degree. A threat, just a threat that I'm gonna come over with a knife could cost you 180 days in jail. Okay, so just think about that. You didn't do anything to anybody. All you're doing is saying, I'm threatening you that I'm gonna seriously harm you. And that is enough to give you six months in jail. Menacing by stalking, as you heard um, uh, Elliot indicate, um, that's a pattern of conduct. You're, you keep um, following somebody and you keep harassing them and it's a, it's a pattern over and over where you're doing it. Um, this includes your cyber stalking type of scenarios. It can start as a misdemeanor of the first degree, but with a prior conviction or with a threat or with trespassing on a location or with the minor as a victim, so somebody under 18 as a victim, uh, somebody with a history of violence with a victim or involving the deadly weapon, it's a felony of the fourth degree and it could carry with it up to 18 months in prison. Again, another offense of violence. Uh, telecommunications harassment. Um, our prosecutor went over that as well, and that's where you use that device to harass somebody. You keep calling, or you keep bothering them, or threatening them in some capacity. Um, telecommunications harassment can start as a misdemeanor of the first degree, up to 180 days in jail. It can go all the way up to a felony of the third degree, which can carry with it up to three years in prison, 36 months. So I want you to understand these have huge consequences and all you're doing, you haven't pointed a gun at anybody, you haven't shot anybody, you do understand, it's just saying something is enough. Um, so your words alone, that's huge. Inducing panic, and that's the one we talked a lot about today, um, for your evacuation of a building because of some kind of a, a um, threat or a uh, you know, some kind of a, a warning that something's going to happen. Um, it can be a misdemeanor of the first degree, up to 180 days in jail, and can work its all the way up to a felony of the second degree. If it involves a school, it is a felony of the second degree and could carry with it up to eight years in prison. That's huge. Um, and that's just causing a school to get um, go into evacuation mode. Um, I'm going to jump in a little bit on the uh, extortion, but it, it, it kind of goes in with the sextortion that went on. Um, somebody says, um, you know, they take one of your images or something that they have um, uh, uh, against you, and they use it against you for money, because uh, they want you to give them money or make you do something for them. Um, and that's what extortion is, and it's a crime of violence, and it's a felony of the third degree, nine months to 36 months in prison. But in talking about the sextortion, that's usually where we see it, and that's where you take a photo of yourself and you send it out to the big bad web out there where you think you're, you're you know, meeting up with somebody that looks attractive or whatever and isn't. And as um, uh, Agent Durker indicated, this is a, a con continuing problem. 
Um, and it's cost a young man, in, just in our area, his life because he didn't know how to get out of it. Please, reach out to somebody if you ultimately, first, don't take the picture. Don't take any picture of yourself. Um, as, an, as a young adult or as a, a juvenile, if you take a picture and send it out, it's against the law, first of all, okay? Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, if you do this and you do get into that scenario, go to somebody. Don't start sending money because it won't stop. You think, oh, I'll just send the first thing of money, it'll be done. Oh, no, they keep working you and working you and working you. And so that's what puts you into that corner um, where that young man uh, didn't think he could get out of. The other thing is sexting itself. So I had a situation in my court a few years back where a young lady, um, uh, underclassman in high school, took a picture of herself trying to get the attention of some senior um, young men. Uh, and the seniors were all adults. She was a juvenile, they were adults. But when she sent it, um, she got in trouble because that's against the law to send that of herself. But in addition to that, she sent it to these guys and they spread it around, like look what so-and-so just sent me, and so they started to spread it. And when they sent it out to somebody else, um, they got in trouble as well. And for them, she got a juvenile offense, they got felony offenses that are sex offenses. So not only did they face felony charges, they also have to be registered as sex offenders. All three of those gentlemen were top of their class or good grades in their school. All of them were heading to college and none of them left for college on time. Um, so, and I have no idea, it's been quite a few years now since that case happened, so I don't know if they could get their life back on track or not, but I do know that they all had to register for minimum of 10 years. So they are still sex offenders under the law right now. So that is how your world can go this way and take a really sharp right turn, and it ends it. So that leads into my last section. Everybody thinks, well, I get in trouble with the court. Judge Coates may or may not send me to jail, but I, I do some jail stint, and I'm, I'm done. I, no big deal, no, nothing going. But the problem is convictions, they have ripple effects in your life, and that's the part you don't necessarily see to laughter, and a lot of defendants don't realize that until after they've done something wrong. Um, the biggest one is your employment. Every, most, almost all employers do background checks. So if you have a crime where you've threatened somebody, a, a, an offense of violence, or you have um, some kind of a sex offense, that's gonna keep you from employment. Um, it's gonna be very, very hard to get empo employment. Sex offenders are, have the hardest ability to get employment. Um, and those three young men who are sex offenders didn't, all they did was send a, send a picture out, and yet they're probably gonna have a hard time getting employment from here on out. Um, uh, the other thing you need to be aware of is that not everything can be sealed. People think, well, I got in trouble, but I'll get it sealed, and that's true to some degree. First, you have to wait for a period of time, and secondly, not all things get sealed, and offenses of violence that are felonies and sex offenses and felonies that are first and second degree do not get sealed. So those are on your record for life. Small business loans. You think, eh, I'm not gonna go to college or I'm gonna start my own business. I don't have to worry about going through a background check with an employer. But if you want a small business loan for your business, you, you get a background check. Rental agreements. Landlords do background checks. They do not want sex offenders. They do not want people with violence in, as tenants. So that can keep you from getting your first apartment or first uh, ability to rent a house. Owning a firearm, when you're legally allowed to um, go out and purchase a firearm, you will not be allowed to because of these convictions. Uh, licensing, nurses especially. I see this with nursing almost on a weekly basis. Um, nurses, um, attorneys, anybody who needs to get a license to do their career, um, they can be prohibited because of these convictions. Traveling, do you know that if you wanna go to Canada and you have a drunk driving charge, you cannot enter into Canada? So imagine a sex offense or a, a, an offense of violence in trying to see the world or getting on a plane and seeing the world. You're probably going to be prohibited and voting, you may have restrictions on voting. Um, all of your teachers in here have been 
had background checks. They have to work with students and with children, and so they have to pass those background checks. So if your gr goal is to be a teacher someday, then this is not the kind of stuff you want to be doing, or coach. And you don't even know about it yet, but someday you may get married and have a couple kids of your own, and you want to be your kid's baseball coach or soccer coach or whatever. If you've got a prior criminal record, you're not going to be help. You cannot you cannot be serve as a coach in those capacities. They will not allow you. So those are and of course college applications and schools and getting into those. So see the ripple effects that happen, way beyond the conviction, way beyond the consequences of jail. It, it can have a lifetime effect on you. And I think I have just a second to tell you a story about a young man who was in my courtroom. He had gotten into trouble between the ages of 18 and 21. He had quite a few prior little convictions on his record. Um, he came into my court three years, three or four years later. He had finished school, top of his class. Um, he was in, in engineering and he just had gotten an opportunity to be, get a job at NASA in space engineering. And he had to get these records sealed. His background check required that he have no convictions. Under the law at the time, I could not seal his record. And um, here was a tough guy from the ages of 18 to 21 who was such a tough guy standing in front of me at age 24, 25, crying, bawling his eyes out because he knew that this opportunity was going to pass him by because of the foolish things that he did prior. So I don't want to see that. I, I was heart-wrenching for me. I, I haven't forgot it, and it's been many, many years since that incident happened, and I'll never forget it because I couldn't help him. So that's why I'm talking to you now, so that you don't make that repeat, that you don't put yourself in that position, and that you don't cost yourself a great opportunity in your future. So good luck to all of you this year in your future endeavors beyond this, and please be careful about what you're doing on social media, okay? Okay, hey, real quick before we leave. Got about a minute or so. I just want to remind everybody, number one, you're all starting to get to that age where this is going to really impact you, not just at a school level, but at a legal level as well. I guess that's the bell, so I'll let you go to seventh period. Have a wonderful day.